Okay. Welcome again, everyone who's here and who's just joined. Um, it gives me immense pleasure to have uh, Professors Samina Raja and Mona Ban with us today. Um, as you know, this is a co-hosted webinar between Stand with Kashmir and Kashmir Solidarity Movement. Um, and today we want to talk about food and ecological systems under occupation in Kashmir. Um, as a reminder, please keep your, I guess you're all on mute already, um, so that's fine. But if you would like to ask any questions, feel free to use the Q&A box and for any comments and reflections on what the um, panelists are talking about, feel free to use the chat um, option box also on Zoom. For those uh, joining us from Facebook, welcome again. Um, and as I mentioned, you can also use the chat function on Facebook to continue the discussion and any questions. Um, as we, you might already know, but since um, August 2019, the Indian government has expedited its assault on Kashmiri people by changing laws that provide li provided limited protection uh, from the Indian state and army to the people. In particular, the assault on laws governing access to land and natural resources have been a key target of the Indian state. Not only do these actions violate international law, they also have grave consequences on the lives and livelihoods of people of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh. The government of India claims that the re-annexation or the abrogation, as they like to call it, um, was done to ensure development and creation of jobs in the region. However, sup superior economic welfare indicators of Jammu and Kashmir in comparison to the national Indian average are well document, documented by data provided by the Indian government itself. In addition, the Kashmir Chamber of Commerce and Industries have estimated over two, two million US dollars of losses within the first four months of the abrogation. Figures from 2018 suggest that more than 21,400 uh, hectares of land are under unauthorized occupation by the army and other government forces in Jammu, Kashmir and Ladakh. As these, official, uh, as these are official government figures, they are likely to be underestimated. Of these 21,400 hectares, to, uh, about 2,500 hectares are in the Jammu region uh, and about 7,000 in Ladakh and the rest are in Kashmir. The post application policy of selling land and natural resources to non-Kashmiri actors is an exercise of, of accumulation by dispossession of the people. The extraction of natural resources and restricting, restricting local populations access to their land resources violates not only political aspirations, but also encroaches upon the human rights to earn a living and food security. In the last few days, we have observed two new assaults on Kashmiri people. First, the new land law allows Indian, Indians to buy land and also provides unrestricted uh, permission to the, to the army to, to occupy land by claiming them to be strategic without any local approval, which used to be the case previously. Um, second uh, are the raids against human rights defenders and NGOs that we've learned of in the last couple of days. And the, the raids continue at the moment. Kashmiris know that the process of resource extraction did not start last year after the abrogation. Illegal claims on spaces have been an old tool in the Indian toolbox of occupation. So today's webinar, we will unpack some of these um, impact of these um, un illegal occupation of land in Jammu and Kashmir on its food and ecological systems. Um, and here we will also shed light on how the new land laws affect may affect the environment and agriculture in Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh. Without further ado, I would like to introduce my panelists for the day. Uh, Professor Samina Raja and Professor, Associate Professor Mona Bhan. Uh, first and foremost, um, Samina uh, Raja is a Professor of um, Urban Planning. She's also the Associate Dean for Research and Inclusive Excellence at the University of Buffalo. Professor Raja is the Principal Investigator for, of the Food Systems Planning and Health, Healthy Communities Lab, i.e. the Food Lab, and Co-Director of Community for Global Health Equity. The Community for Global Health Equity focuses on understanding the role of planning and policy in building sustainable food systems and healthy communities. We also, as I said, have Mona Bhan with us. She is 
an associate professor of cultural anthropology who works on whose work explores the role of economic and infrastructural development in counterinsurgency operations and people's resistance movements uh, to protracted war and conflict. Um, her uh, particular focus is obviously Kashmir, as we know. Um, her book, Counterinsurgency Development and Politics of Identity from Warfare to Welfare, was published by Rutler in 2014. The book examines the relationship between everyday forms of militarization and social life in Kashmir. Um, so from here on, I will uh, pass the mic to Samina. Again, a quick reminder for those who have joined us a little bit uh, late, please use the chat and Q&A function to continue the conversation in the background. Thank you, Samina. Thank you, uh, Mehrush, for the frame and setting up. Um, uh, it's a bittersweet time to be present here for this uh, conversation. Really grateful for the space that you have created and Stand with Kashmir has created for a conversation based on reason and a civil dialogue about um, really complex problems uh, and a dialogue that must also at the same time be incredibly candid and honest. I have to say that uh, in preparation for this webinar, um, I had to change my material uh, rapidly because of the changing positions and policy stances on the ground. So um, while I'll be speaking about policy change and what that means for food systems, I have to acknowledge that it is a um, challenging personal time for people with lived experience in Kashmir. So just wanna begin with that. Um, I will start by providing some context so allow me to share my screen um, and Mehrush, please let me know if um, that does not work. So I need just a second. So I am going to talk about Kashmir um, and recognizing that our audience is from many different places um, from across the globe. So I'm going to provide a little bit of context um, about Kashmiri food systems and then proceed to talk about uh, what is happening right now, which is undermining food sovereignty and specifically focus on the role of land use policy, but we could talk about policy more broadly um, on what is happening in Kashmir. Um, I will begin with gratitude. In difficult times, we are carried by many people on the ground, and this conversation to which I am giving a voice is really about people who are working in Kashmir. So first shout out to farmers in Kashmir, who are continuing to do the work that they do and research affiliates and residents in Kashmir who continue despite incredibly difficult circumstances. This work would not be possible without my team here in Buffalo, where I must begin by acknowledging the lands that we stand on of the Iroquois Confederacy, Native American lands on which we stand and do our work. This work is also supported by colleagues and community of global health equity. And of course, thank you to Kashmir Solidarity Network and Stand with Kashmir and all of you who have chosen the time to join us in this conversation today. I'll do a three part thing. I'll set up the frame for talking about food sovereignty and then bring you to the ground on Kashmir because sometimes abstract conversations can distract us from the very real tangible challenges that people have experienced, not just from 2019, but really for a much longer period that I will traverse uh, in my comments. And then we'll save a little bit of time uh, to talk about uh, way forward, but open it up to discussion later. So I'll begin by talking about food sovereignty because I think one of the challenges about talking about food is the narrowness, narrowness with which it is presented in many disciplines and in fact in policy circles that draws our attention away from where it really needs to rest. An incorrect analysis then therefore brings us to an incorrect solution. An incorrect diagnosis in a medical case, for example, can bring us to an incorrect 
uh, prescription on what should be done in a community. So that is why beginning with food sovereignty rather than the term that is often thrown about food security is incorrect in the case of Kashmir. So let me begin by first sharing some language um, so that we are all on the same page. Uh, when I talk about a food system, which I will talk about quite a bit as I explain food sovereignty, I will be taking us from what we might call field on the left side of your screen all the way to the right, which is a plate of rice that is being consumed by people sitting at a shared meal. There are four people to a plate, which in Kashmir is called a trum. A food system is one that enables that food to go from left to right, from the farm to it getting harvested, for it getting prepared uh, through drying methods or winnowing all the way to the consumer. If we focus just on food security, on the experiences of people on the right side, the presumption is that we make the rest preceding the food that reaches our mouths invisible. The frame of food sovereignty insists that what happens with people who eat really is preceded by what happens to the people who grow, who process, who distribute, and put all the labor into getting that food to people. So Kashmiri food systems, let me take you back a little bit. And here I'm using rice as a representational food because it is central to Kashmiri cuisine and culture and celebrations. Um, Traditional Kashmiri methods use indigenous climate-friendly growing methods. The supply chain is pretty localized. In the United States, the idea of community-supported agriculture is quite well known. In Kashmir, community-supported agriculture was the norm. You just knew the farmer who grew your rice and brought it to your family at the end of the growing season. Uh, there are cooperative practices that are in harvesting, drying, and distribution. There are cultural celebrations when women in a neighborhood gather to harvest together, where family members come and help people in um, dealing with the large-scale harvest. Of course, all of these indigenous methods um, are being disrupted um, for a variety of reasons, which I will talk about. But in short, we had, we have, a food system in Kashmir that worked for its people and is currently being undermined. Um, it is being undermined because the frame is not a food sovereignty, it remains focused on food security. So what does food sovereignty mean? There are many different ways of explaining it and really the credit goes to La Via Campesina, a peasant movement, led movement that brought this to the global attention and insists on right of people, smallholder growers and peasants to define their own food and agricultural systems. Right of people to healthy and culturally preferred foods producing ecologically sound methods. A system that centers the aspirations and needs of those who produce, distribute and consume food rather than the demand of markets and corporations. In all of this, the power to determine your own future and the future of the food system rests with people. Governance, not government, is central to this conversation. So this food sovereignty, I would argue, is being undermined in Kashmir, but that we actually in Kashmir have a history of incredible practices and policies that protected food sovereignty. Stepping away from the food sovereignty has allowed policymakers to shift the focus on food security on perhaps provisioning for Kashmiris what they really had the ability and the resources to provision for themselves. So what that does is purposefully, and I'm gonna animate a little bit here, is purposefully draw our attention to food security, but uh, neglect the fact, as Mehrush said in the very beginning, that it is actually food security rates and outcomes in Kashmir are higher, but it's important for us to understand that food sovereignty predetermines food security. Food security exists in Kashmir, there are better outcomes because of the historic policies and food system uh, controls that were in the land among the people that are at risk right now. We are seeing in front of us 
an example, a counterexample to food sovereignty, while the rest of the world clamors for creating more food sovereign and food equitable food systems, Kashmir is um, unfolding in a way where food inequity is being uh, lifted up, food sovereignty is being undermined. So what does that mean on the ground? Having set that frame, I'm gonna take you through a little bit of timeline. Uh, because Kashmir is, uh, for people unfamiliar, a little bit complicated, um, I have for you a nifty timeline. It is broken up, split up in three parts, 1800s and 1900s on the bottom left. And then because time accelerates, it goes from 1950 to 2010 in the middle part. And then time is accelerating regrettably even faster. So I have split 2019 and 2020 to the top. So the scales are different, but we're moving left to right in time. On the bottom left, um, it is important for people unfamiliar with Kashmir to know that um, Kashmir was controlled by a king ruler, locally called as the Dogra Kingdom. But the fact was that that regime was very difficult for Kashmiri growers and for peasants, which resulted in fact one of the earliest peasant revolts against the ruler in 1931, which set the stage for one of the most impressive agrarian reforms uh, witnessed in the world, I would say. So if you move fast forward to 1994, that was a time in Kashmir when a group of forward-thinking progressive um, intellectuals gathered and advised the leader at that time to establish what became known as Naya Kashmir in the local language or the New Kashmir Charter that explicitly called for peasant rights in 1944. Um, that led eventually to a law called the Big Landed Estates Act in 1950, a land use policy that insisted on redistribution of land to tillers or peasants or farm workers, as we say. Those of us who are working on farm workers' rights in the United States will appreciate this progressive forward-thinking law from 1950 that took land, large estates, and redistributed them to the peasants without any compensation to the large landholders and led to one of the most egalitarian land reforms uh, of the time. And in fact, as a result of that, um, we have one of the smallest land holding sites in Kashmir today, which um, those of us who work in food systems work recognize what concentration of land lots and agricultural production mechanisms does uh, through industrialization of agriculture. It is not healthy. But in Kashmir, it was a much more egalitarian land distribution method in 1950. Um, subsequently, uh, I think enamored by some of the exported ideas from the West, we saw the enactment of the Jammu and Kashmir Development Act in 1970, which set the stage for what came to be quote unquote modern development planning that unfortunately, regrettably uh, started, I think, decimating the conditions in Kashmir over the years to come. So on the top of the timelines are things in black, which are things that people in Kashmir did. And um, on the bottom of the timeline in red, especially on the right side, are things that government of India has done uh, after 2019. So I'm gonna fast forward quite a bit, but of course I'm sure Mona, Dr. Pan will talk about some of this. But in 2019, what happened suddenly, as uh, Mehrush and Dr. Talk, I should say, mentioned, um, Government of India passed what is called the Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Act on August 5th, uh, this should say 2019, my apologies. And what happened is that it enabled Government of India to decimate all these progressive laws that were enabled to support a more egalitarian agrarian um, environment. And most recently, three days ago, on October 26th, I've actually lost track of time, uh, the government declared um, this new order, which in a single order, the government repealed, completely rejected policies, I believe about 12 existing progressive policies that supported agricultural and food systems in Kashmir. 
and then amended another, um, I forget the total number, but about more than 20 laws uh, that they amended. But to highlight the key items from those laws, and I have to confess that I'm still um, going through the policy document because it is so long and complicated, um, and one has to cross-reference every change in the order from 2020 to umpteen laws from the 50s, so you can imagine that, it, that cross-referencing is not easy. But I'd like to draw your attention to what happens uh, to the big landed estates law come uh, October 26th. So sale of lands to non-Kashmiris is allowed. Um, and then military now can declare any area of strategic importance and take control and completely repeals the big landed estates act. In other words, egalitarian goes out the window and uh, simultaneously, uh, it opens up the possibility for moneyed, wealthier uh, capitalists to enter the area in the name of capitalism. But um, as those of us who work in food systems are aware, smallholder farmers will get pushed off the land uh, at faster pace than any other group in Kashmir because of limited income, because of um, their own economic conditions. So that's the condition in which we are. Um, and just to be absolutely accurate, and since this webinar is going to be online, I am going to make this modification right now. Thank you for your patience. Okay, so we'll come back to this timeline when Dr. Bond talks. Um, I'm gonna go forward and take us through what this means on the ground. On the ground, it means that farmers uh, work in the face of militarization. In some recent interviews that um, we had access to, farmers reported that they had to get up at 3 a.m. in the night sometimes to move their harvest uh, before conditions on the streets got bad and to get things to the market. So um, enactment of land laws is going to push production down. It is going to enable um, decimation of the food system and conversion of land and encroachment of agricultural land by other urban uses is going to reduce our ability to be food sovereign in Kashmir. Disruptions in local supply chain are already ho happening, but what will also happen uh, that opening to global food supply chains is going to remove the possibility of uh, strengthening localized food supply chains. In short, accelerated urbanization, accelerated settlement of non kashmiris that has been made possible by the laws does not bode well for the food system. So uh, a few insights to share uh, as a reminder that we have to really focus on food sovereignty, not food security. Who actually controls these lands? Who gets calls the shots on what the market um, is going to look like? Who's going to profit from it? Who controls the value added from agriculture? As far as planning is concerned, food systems planning, the area that I represent, is regrettably a new area across the globe. In the United States, 1% of local governments actually engage in food systems planning. But be that as it may, um, in Kashmir, communities have to reimagine urban planning. It cannot be a state-led activity because the state has essentially illustrated itself to be illegitimate as far as the concerns of Kashmiris are um, uh, as far as concerns of Kashmiris are to be kept in mind. I would argue that perhaps Mahalla committee planning, not master planning, is what we need in Kashmir. Governance, not government, is what we need if we are going to protect our food sovereignty. The way forward may seem bleak, but there, we cannot afford to be inactive. Uh, the first thing is demilitarization is essential to a secure environment in which the food system can function and people can function. That means that people in Kashmir have to self-determine their future. Self-determination is a central need in any um, governance arrangement that speaks to uh, genuinely giving voice to people. Uh, so we cannot, there is no reason to not extend that to Kashmiris. In order to do that, international attention and solidarity has to exist for Kashmiris. And most immediately, repeal of land laws that use the combined power of military and policy to dispossess farmers is essential. Locally, 
Um, I do want to point out that uh, Kashmiris for a long time have figured out how to survive and be resilient. I'm not a fan of resilience because it implies that the burden of uh, other people's mistakes, people's mistakes outside aside of Kashmir or even Kashmiris themselves historically has to be borne by people, farmers today. Um, so that aside, I do think that Kashmiris have the power to invest in their own local food system. Buy Kashmiri, buy your local tomul and your hawk and your maas uh, for the Kashmiris on the line. Reignite cooperative models of resource sharing, which is already happening, and reignite Kashmiri placemaking. So uh, the idea of Kashmiri placemaking means that there are already um, uh, strategies and ways in which Kashmiris organize themselves. Right now, for example, in every neighborhood, which in Kashmir is called a mohalla, a mohalla committee is um, takes care of the needs of people in that committee. We have to reimagine what a mohalla planning looks like and not wait for more formal uh, ways. Uh, regrettably, I heard the mayor talk about McDonald's as being a good idea in Kashmir. Um, regret that is not a good idea anywhere. It's not good for the food environment in the United States, let alone in Kashmir. So we can come back to that. Uh, thank you, Shukriya, and I look forward to um, more conversation. I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Bond. Uh, I will preface as I transition to her that I'm going to go back to my timeline slide uh, because we agreed that she might be using it as well. Um, I do have to also say that um, she is the scholar here. I'm the student here. I'm looking really forward to putting pieces together between um, ecological justice and food justice. Over to you, Mona. Uh, thank you so much, Samina, for this wonderful um, uh, introduction to the issue and the detailed understanding of uh, issues that are at stake. And I'm as much a student uh, as you might be. Uh, so thanks also for your generosity here. But I also want to start uh, with thanking SWK and um, and, and, and Mehrush for coming together and helping us get to these issues. Usually um, what's happened is uh, ecological issues, food issues get brushed under the carpet and they're seen to be dissociated from the larger political conflict. And I, I'm really happy to see uh, that that's, uh, that's certainly we passed that moment, uh, at least in Kashmir's history where uh, it's now possible to keep them separate. Um, so in any case, as, as Dr. Raja mentioned, uh, it's been a couple of very difficult days as we wrap our heads around a slew of changes to land laws that the Indian government has introduced that are shifting the realities on the ground at a dizzying pace. These changes were set into motion with the abrogation of Article 370 and 35A, as you see that on the timeline last year, uh, which, uh, as, as both uh, Dr. Tak and Raja have mentioned, accelerated Kashmir's militarization while simultaneously facilitating the extractive logics of capital accumulation. Since August 5th of last year, the Indian government has encouraged the piecemeal auctioning of Kashmir's land and resources to private Indian investors through online bidding contracts in which Kashmiris could not participate for the longest time because of the absence of 4G internet connectivity. Indians, and, and of course, they continue not to be uh, able to participate. Indian syndicates are using their uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting these wonderful journalists uh, who've done uh, exciting work and Uthar Parvez, he, he's in the audience list. I want to, uh, you know, shout out to Uthar for his incredible work on, on environmental issues in Kashmir. Um, so uh, they've been using this financial muscle power to outcompete Kashmiris and to utilize the government's 6,000 acre land bank to set up multiplexes, film production centers, IT parks and medical complexes. Um, and also alcohol stores, apparently. And all this while, Kashmiris have experienced heightened rates and surveillance, a series of militarized lockdowns and deadly encounters in which their homes are raised to ground and men and women detained in prisons in Kashmir and India through punitive laws such as the Public Safety Act. Indeed, just yesterday, uh, an assault on the rights of human rights defenders and journalists um, has once again coincided with the slew of legal changes to land laws that uh, we heard from Dr. Raja that paves the way for India's settler colonial project, anchored in the settler colonial fantasy to change the demographics of the only Muslim majority state in the region. 
We know from other contexts, particularly from the Palestinian and the US uh, context, that settler logics work to seize and appropriate property rights over land and resources, while also ensuring the removal of indigenous populations and a violent erasure of their rights and knowledge systems. Therefore, while people's lives are at stake, any discussion of food or resource sovereignty, or for that matter, climate justice more broadly, cannot be fully addressed without also locating them within frameworks of political justice for a people who have been fighting for their fundamental rights to life and liberty for over 70 years. In other words, the concept of environmental justice is not very meaningful unless it transcends narrow concerns with environmental protection and sustainability. In Kashmir's case, it means, uh, as we've already heard very clearly from our speakers, it means that environmental justice and questions of resource and political sovereignty, as well as people's long struggle for self-determination, go hand in hand. Anything short of that reproduces, anything short of that can reproduce climate activism or environmental justice itself um, as a weak alibi for a political status quo that intensifies marginalities as it leaves unaddressed the damaging impacts of a continued military occupation. And I'm saying this also because I've seen environmental work um, for the longest time, uh, even in the context of Kashmir, has uh, purposefully divorced itself from the larger political questions of self-determination. And in large part, it uh, has to do, of course, with the, the clamping down of any form of work uh, on the ground. So people have tried to keep these two domains separate, uh, understandably so. But I think we are at this moment, um, as, as we know, based on uh, what's been happening on the ground, that we cannot afford to keep these two conversations uh, separate anymore. Uh, oftentimes, I also want to quickly say this, uh, I get this question from non-Kashmiris about why they should care about Kashmir. It seems uh, distant enough uh, that it should really not have much of a measurable impact on people's lives here. Uh, but I, I feel why we should, why the world needs to care about Kashmir, uh, apart from uh, it simply being a humanitarian concern, is that uh, it, is, it, it couldn't be clearer uh, uh, at any other time perhaps than it is now as we face a planetary pandemic and realize that while borders might allow us to keep people out, they do prove, uh, they do prove rather ineffective when it comes to dealing with non-human forces, be it viruses, acid or plastic rains, or the implications of deforestation and glacial melting in the long durée. As climate change uh, tears up our mutual vitals, uh, according to Murtaza Hussein, we have to consider new and creative forms of solidarity and internationalism and recognize that militarism and the environmental crisis are intertwined and mutually reinforcing. The need therefore is to develop radical ecological frameworks and action that are anti-militaristic and anti-occupation at their core. Since the 1980s, more than 30% of uh, the Siachen Glacier that some of you might know of, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an uninhabited uh, glacier between India and Pakistan. And the only reason India is holding on to this glacier is because uh, it doesn't want uh, direct communication links between uh, China and Pakistan. Um, and has been spending billions of dollars for its upkeep, not for the glacial's upkeep, but for the upkeep of uh, the, the military forces there. So 30% of that glacier is already lost, has been lost in the, uh, in the last 20 uh, to 30 years. And geologists have repeatedly argued, and these are geologists, some of them based in Kashmir, uh, that glaciers in Kashmir are retreating more and are losing mass at a greater speed compared to uh, Himalayan, other Himalayan glaciers in India. And this of course is in part because of deforestation, because of uh, the heavy use of uh, you know, military artel artillery, uh, because of how this, the, the land has been repurposed for defense and security, um, and, and for warfare schools that are of course based in meadows and uh, pasture lands that also reduces people's access to these very vital zones. Um, a major report released earlier this year uh, found rising temperatures will melt at least a third of the region's glacial, glaciers by 2100, even if average global temperatures rise um, 
are limited to 1.5 degrees centigrade. So this is just to kind of situate Kashmir within a larger uh, Himalayan ecosystem, also to make the point that uh, people who might not be that aware of why Kashmir should matter to them, um, I, I feel uh, you know this is an urgent ecological crisis at hand. And if we don't pay attention to that uh, now, I mean, it's, it's already, I feel, we should have been paying attention to it much earlier. But if not now, then we're really hurtling toward um, an environmental crisis of uh, extreme proportions. And this is not alarming. This is just a pure uh, fundamental science uh, with regards to climate change. So coming back to Kashmir, uh, while the Hindu Rashtra or the Hindu nations, uh, Naya Kashmir vision that, um, that is a really, um, you know, uh, basically a decimation of the Naya Kashmir of, of the 1950s that we heard from Dr. Raja's talk, while this vision brazenly deploys new development and domicile uh, and land laws to eliminate Kashmiri Muslims from their homeland, depopulating Kashmir's strategic landscapes has been an ongoing feature of Indian development praxis for a very long time. The erasure of populations from their landscapes, again, a settler colonial fantasy, was affected uh, even prior to August uh, 5th of last year through legal and infrastructural interventions that impacted land use, distribution, and its intergenerational transmission, which has been foundational uh, to create wealth, value, and livelihoods for Kashmiri communities, right? So that's, again, something that we heard from Raja, Dr. Raja's presentation, the link between uh, access to land or land ownership and food sovereignty and, and uh, ability, people's abilities to feed themselves and their families without having to worry about where their food is going to come from on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I want to offer a few quick examples from my work among communities who live along the line of control, the disputed line of control, uh, one of the most densely militarized um, de facto borders. Uh, and these communities are located in Gurez and Bandipura. And what I want to uh, really do here is to provide an illustration of how militarized interventions, um, which come in many different shapes and forms, also in the form of big dams, um, have impacted people's homes, their long-term livelihood strategies, and their abilities to access traditional food sources by harming biodiversity, glaciers, forests, and uh, for creating potential for poverty and malnutrition, in addition to long and short-term uh, dispossessions. Now, if you, uh, if you know anything about Kashmir, um, uh, one of the things that you, you probably might know is people say, uh, despite the situation, nobody goes hungry to bed, right? People have food to eat. And that's not to be taken lightly because that's a situation that might be reversed uh, sooner than we think. And that is the other sort of crisis and the other urgency I want to outline. Uh, at, at the same time, I also want to talk about how uh, land dispossessions and water dispossessions go hand in hand. Uh, so just to, you know, a, a, a quick sort of, uh, I don't think I have that much time to uh, dwell into how India has been, uh, has been appropriating Kashmir's rivers for the longest time to fulfill its own needs for power and industry. Uh, but usually when we think of waters, when we think of the Indus River system, which is a shared river system between India uh, and Pakistan and China and Afghanistan as well, um, we often think of a water war. We think of the scenario between India and Pakistan where there might be a water war in the future where, because of these dams that are being built on either side of uh, the line of control that India uh, might at some point end up weaponizing these uh, dams to flood Pakistan or to create droughts. Uh, but if you, uh, if you uh, work with communities on the ground, uh, the war is of a very different nature, right? They already see it as a war against Kashmiri civilians. So dams are already seen as a war, um, as an instrument of war against local populations um, in many ways. And I'll, I'll speak to that just in a second, because it also, uh, making dams uh, on rivers also means, uh, apart from claiming water resources, it also means claiming land resources and land grabs and forced land acquisitions, which directly impacts people's abilities, especially people in the mountains, highland uh, mountains, to uh, produce food for their own sustenance. Uh, but apart from that, um, an RTI, um, 
an inquiry that was uh, that was uh, that was initiated by a group of uh, environmental activists in 2016 for example revealed that the nhpc which is the national hydroelectric power corporation india's premier uh, uh, dam building a corporation has earned uh, three billion U.S. dollars uh, in revenue on dams uh, on Kashmiri rivers, while they've only allotted 12 percent of that electricity to Kashmiris. And this is in the last uh, from 2001 to 2011. These statistics, the three billion dollars, and it's even more now because uh, dam building has intensified, and in part uh, the uh, the reason for abrogating. Um, uh, the, 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 the uh, you know, semi-autonomous status of Kashmir was to be able to appropriate Kashmir's rivers and Kashmir's land more freely than the Indian government has been able to do in the past. Indeed, uh, you know, most places that I work in along the de facto uh, border, um, people don't have access to electricity even, right? So even though dams uh, are being built on their land, uh, literally on their lands. So now, I mean, we've, we've, we've also heard this, uh, um, the new laws that have um, been, uh, that have been passed in the last two days are now claiming that any area in Kashmir can be deemed strategic, right? And if it's deemed strategic, then the military can control it uh, without any uh, further legal interventions or legal mechanisms. But much like that, the strategy, of course, the strategy of declaring something strategic has been in use for the longest time. Uh, so uh, in Grays and in Bandipura, both land grabs happened uh, precisely by that logic. Uh, so in Bandipura, for example, the logic that was used to grab land, to, uh, to forcibly acquire land from local populations, it fell under this uh, rubric of compulsory mode of acquisition that was called compulsory, which means uh, there was no way people could have uh, voiced their uh, resentment or their opposition to these land grabs. In Gurez, on the contrary, it seemed less draconian because the way land was uh, forcibly acquired was under the logics of something called a private negotiation mode. But essentially what that did was it picked certain key uh, representatives uh, who were of course, um, you know, became kind of these intermediaries and they were the ones who ended up, uh, uh, you know, uh, selling their land first. So in a sense, this idea that some place can be deemed strategic and then easily acquired or forcibly acquired by the military has been in operation for the longest time, even before the current, uh, you know, uh, spate of uh, laws, the, the, the most recent laws were passed. Uh, so that, that's just something to keep in mind. Um, uh, what's also happened is, yeah, so land grabs in both Grays and Manipura, therefore, as I said, have been affected through legal provisions that deem resistance to the state's extractive interventions seditious. So the point here being the moment you call something a compulsory land acquisition, any opposition to that becomes a national security issue. It is deemed uh, strategic enough to be, uh, to, to, to be, I'm sorry, to then frame people as seditious if they end up resisting such land grabs. So um, for communities in Gurez and Barnipura, hydropower uh, has been an instrument to rid the mountain valley of its indigenous populations and transform it into an empty borderland. Uh, such concerns, of course, have intensified after to, uh, have intensified after 2016 when Modi particularly weaponized Kashmir's rivers against Pakistan, threatening to re unilaterally revoke the tra transboundary, transboundary and water sharing in this water treaty after the Uri attack in which 22 soldiers or Indian soldiers were killed allegedly in a planned attack by Pakistan. So I want to argue here that uh, the way to think about Gurez Bandipura and now to think broadly about Kashmir, I think the framework that really allows us to see what is at stake is uh, to see Kashmir as a sacrifice zone, right? And this really comes from a Russian uh, nuclear fallouts that were happening, um, you know, in, in, uh, in, in during World War II, uh, when certain uh, areas were irreversibly transformed ecologically and their, uh, their, the, the vitality of their glaciers, their rivers uh, was 
impaired through, uh, you know, through investments in uh, militarized infrastructure. Um, so I feel Gurez and Barnipura both, by which you're being so close to this de facto militarized border, um, they've been sort of at the front lines of India's war against Pakistan, right? And their uh, cross border or territorial rivalry. At the same time, th these, both, these areas have been at the forefront of India's extractive capitalism for the longest time, as I said, even before 2000, uh, uh, 2019. And, and oftentimes, you know, up until uh, last year, the, you, the discourses that were used to legitimize, to sanction Gurez as a sacrifice zone or to see Bandipur as a sacrifice zone was this idea of uh, what I take from Uditi Sen's work in Andaman Nicobar Islands, uh, a de facto terra nullius, right? So when you think of a terra nullius, uh, it's essentially uh, an unoccupied territory. Right? You, see, you imagine landscapes or you imagine spaces as uh, unpopulated or underpopulated, right? And that then becomes an easy way, an easy justification for states or militaries to appropriate land. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so uh, in, in Gurez in particular, what you saw, how you saw this terra nullius being affected was uh, through phrases and everyday tropes, seemingly innocuous tropes, such as uh, calling uh, Gurez a virgin landscape, right? So virgin landscape, uh, meaning underpopulated, unbuilt, unproductive. And at the same time, I mean, I was, it's pretty shocking when I used to speak with uh, government officials um, and uh, these geologists who were working on the dam about these dam induced displacements, oftentimes the response I got from uh, these officials was, uh, we wonder why people even want to live in these places. Um, what's there to live for in these places? So it was already imagined as an empty, barren uh, borderland, right? And because you're imagining places as empty and barren, or virgin for that matter, it is then, uh, it invisibilizes the, the scale, the spade and the stakes of uh, dam induced displacements. And already in a, in a place like Gurez, what we're talking about is a 30,000 population in, uh, in a region where there's 100,000 military uh, soldiers stationed. So in that sense, uh, I mean, the idea is to, um, to, of course, erase the military bootprint on uh, Grace's landscape. So, uh, as I said, so in a territory already imagined as unpopulated or underpopulated or thinly populated, then depopulation was the outcome of geography rather than its complex history, right? And that's something we also need to bear in mind is the ways uh, displacements uh, and, and human evacuation uh, Muslim evacuation now in particular from the Kashmir Valley uh, is somehow attributed to ge geography and to, uh, uh, to, to also the lack of entrepreneurship that Kashmiris demonstrate, quote unquote, and hence this constant sort of uh, reference to development, right, coming from India, the development largest coming from India, entrepreneurship coming from India, uh, skill building enterprises uh, coming from India to equip Kashmiris to utilize their resources optimally. Uh, how much time do I have, Mirush? I think if you would maybe just wrap up now. Yeah, just, just last, last uh, point that also I think that speaks to uh, what Samina was earlier arguing about food sovereignty versus food security. So one thing um, to keep in mind again is when you imagine these spaces as empty uh, spaces or as terra nullius, um, you're also of course not seeing, not seeing how local farmers have been utilizing their land and their resources. So for example, uh, you know, for the longest time what I heard these geologists and the scientists working on the dam often tell me was this land is unproductive, grazy land is unproductive and I often ask them why that was the case when in fact, you know, local farmers grew thrumba, which is a form of buckwheat, they grew rajma, they grew a lot of potatoes, aloo. Um, the, the, the response was, well, one, they don't grow rice. And we've often tried to uh, force them to grow rice, force them to grow paddy, but uh, they just can't grow it. This land does not grow paddy. And the question was, well, what if 
you know, they don't want to grow paddy. They want to continue to grow thrumba, which they haven't been able to do anyways. Then the question is, well, it's a staple crop, so we need it for food security. But of course, what's completely uh, erased in that discourse is how local people for the longest time have relied on thrumba as a staple crop, not rice as a staple crop. And while this might seem completely unrelated to the larger conflict, what I'm trying to say is if you don't pay close attention to food sovereignty issues in Kashmir, it's very easy for outside forces such as the military, such as the NHPC, to appropriate these discourses about unproductivity of land and, and its people to then legitimize forced evictions of people from their land. I'll just stop there and uh, hopefully respond to questions. Thank you, Mona. That was um, very interesting to hear, um, specifically also from your own research in Gurais um, and Bandipura. Um, uh, we have a list of questions already, um, and the first one is um, from Madiha Ayub, uh, who's a student at, of urban design at the University of Michigan. Um, she asks, how do we decode the spatial mechanics, uh, me mechanisms of military practice through urban planning and regional policies to effectively design a counter mechanism that addresses and ignites a deep rooted place in bracket space making? I hope I said it appropriately, <laughs> a bit of a mouthful. Um, but also Could you should I, be able um, to see the question. Stop questions. sharing my screen so we can talk to each other a bit. Yeah. Okay. Samina, um, or do you want to take this one because it's in specifically sure. in relation to urban design? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think there's a pronoun in that question that I want to be mindful of. It says, how do we do this um, at, through urban planning and through urban design? I think um, conflict regions and regions that are occupied reveal the limits of urban design and urban planning when proposed by outsiders. I think uh, one of the things that urban planners and urban designers, um, and I guess I should define who I mean by that, I don't think of urban planners or urban designers as people who work for the government. I think of uh, people who decide to plant trees in their neighborhood as urban designers, uh, people who decide that they need to have uh, support for their kanduran or their bakery in their neighborhood um, as a way to protect urban design or urban fabric of that neighborhood. So um, it's really important to reimagine who gets to claim the role of an urban planner or urban designer in a space of conflict. Having said that, I think urban designers and urban planners, and I, uh, it's potentially the question comes from perhaps, hopefully, somebody who is a uh, student with roots in Kashmir um, um, or not, but they could support um, helping document how militarization is changing um, the city. Um, as anybody familiar with Kashmir knows, uh, the military, in fact, imposed a certain set of barricades on the map of the city of Srinagar that completely disrupted people's ability to read their own neighborhoods. So reading of neighborhoods is not only a physical thing, it's an emotional thing. It's something we learn over our lifetimes, and that was disrupted. I only use that example to say that in that condition, uh, planners urban planners and urban designers who are countering those practices can uh, support by documenting indigenous practices um, in documenting the memories of those indigenous practices, documenting the identity of Kashmir in its uh, built environment. Um, and that can be in a variety of places. It can be in documenting the foodscapes in our urban environments. It could be at very microscopic scale. What does a kandurwan or a bakery shop look like? Why does it look like that way? Why are we being told that it is time to modernize and maybe have a McDonald's? Uh, why do we need malls? Why can't we have a traditional um, Mysuma Bazaar be kind you know, the world over we're talking about pop-up urbanism. And in Kashmir, we are homogenizing urbanism to fit a military state ideal. 
Um, so I invite this um, incredible thinker who asked this question to put her talents in use in, in service of places like Kashmir. Thank you, Samina. May I also add to that when you were talking about um, the introduction of McDonald's and other restaurants um, uh, that in in some forms have contributed to the um, to uh, ob rise in obesity around the world, if I may say, um, that um, the the trends in like uh, urbanization of rural areas also in relation to these public health questions around food and availability of food and the changing nature of food markets in Kashmir is also something that um, has been, um, I, I have observed on a completely anecdotal level, but something that also the Kashmiris who are the local mahalla committees that you're talking about should also perhaps pay attention to, um, and I know this sounds a little bit top down that coming from an, an academic like myself, but being Kashmiri, I think this, these are the kind of conversations we need to be having amongst ourselves in terms of what um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the stress or the, or on urbanization also of rural and urban spaces um, mm -hmm. uh, and food markets is something, yeah, so. So very uh, if I would use public health friendly language, I would say that uh, Srinagar city specifically was a non-obesogenic environment uh, up until the 1970s uh, and starting, but even prior to that, starting in the 1970s, we actually changed the built environment. Even now we celebrate the creation of flyovers. We celebrate the creation of automobile ownership we celebrate sedentary behavior and we here i mean neoliberal uh, policies that mm -hmm. encourage that kind of consumption capitalism etc um, so we have experienced in kashmir the advent of an obesogenic environment and um, i think we need to figure out how we are going to protect ourselves against that in kashmir um, Anyway, it's complicated, but I agree with you. I think uh, reviving and protecting some of our indigenous practices that were actually protective, to Mona's point, about the grains that were being used. I use the example of rice, but we actually had a lot of varieties of high fiber varieties of rice mm -hmm. that have essentially been eliminated because we're being encouraged to switch to a more homogenous, low nutrition, high calorie food environment. Um, so it's pretty uh, stealthy, but uh, it's time that we do something with that. I, I just want to add to that, you know, um, and usually when we think of urban design, I mean, I also, as an anthologist, I'm very interested in how urbanity is uh, constructed and envisioned. So for me, I work in a very quote unquote rural setting. Uh, and yet uh, I, I see infrastructure itself introducing uh, urbanity of a kind that, mm. of course, is terribly unfamiliar to people, right? The concrete and the, the scale of built infrastructure, uh, which to me really complicates this assumed binary between ruler and urban. Uh, and uh, at some point, I'd be very curious to see how urban designers think about urban and what that means. And I'm sure there's been stuff on that. But uh, this is to say also that uh, the urban infrastructure or this built infrastructure brings in uh, with it certain mo modernist regimes also, right? So for example, land use practices, uh, it, it, it is oftentimes that uh, local farmers in Grace uh, were forced, as I said, not just to grow rice, but also to change the way they grew crops. So they want to do, uh, they do something called multi-cropping fields, which is a very common thing among highland uh, or high mountain uh, yeah. you know, pastoral communities where they will use the same plot of land to grow multiple crops. And these, these, these uh, you know, the scientists would come in and, and basically tell them how to be more productive with their land and how to change the yields based on more regimented modernist forms of cropping and land use. So what I think is very important to recognize here is urban or infrastructure, which I see quote unquote as urban, and I still have to think through that 
correlation a little more, uh, but it does bring with it certain discursive of of frames of thinking, certain material ways to think about land use practices that we really need to challenge. Yeah, and um, on that, I would like to draw attention of the audience on, um, you know, the this the practice these practices, the suggested practices by the Indian state and the state gov state gov state government in Jammu and Kashmir also link how that links to the national food security policies of Indian agriculture, and the and the history of that and the focus of on rice and wheat since the Green Revolution and um, you know investments in irrigation policies of specifically for rice new rice technologies. And um, I mean, we've seen now how that the policy of old policy of green revolution and the extended policy of green revolution in India has now come to bite Punjab and Haryana because the water resources are completely depleted. But then, uh, because these two states in India have become uh, the big grain bowls of the of the nation, there this bulk. Um, production of rice is now export Im or imported to Jammu and Kashmir, also dismantling the traditional ways in which rice has been cultivated in the region, and then rec recognizing that this that there is ac 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 um, excess uh, rice um, yield within in the larger country of India, the Indian government now has asked. Kashmiri farmers to move away from rice cultivation also in the plains to then move to horticulture because of um, lack of water resources, depleting water resources in the region. But um, and that, um, and I know Arthur Pervez, who's also in, on Samina already mentioned, is on the webinar today, has done a lot of work on and spoken to these uh, farmers who have been asked by the state to, uh, to shift their cultivation practices to horticulture. And um, to that also links um, um, links the you know the reaction of the Indian state after abrogation how they penalized the apple traders and the apple farmers of Kashmir by blocking um, the national highway that connects um, Kashmir to to the plains of India where the, these apple pro produce were sold. Um, okay, I will <laughs> stop stop at that um, and uh, maybe I'll ask the next question now. Um, Samina, there is a question in relation to, um, uh, could you explain why food sovereignty has to be the focus instead of food security and the following questions around um, uh, who would potentially benefit from having food security as a focus? It's a good question. Um, so the Phrase food security um, is typically, well, it's defined in many different ways, but one way it might be about uh, whether people in Kashmir have food to eat or not. So globally, sometimes food security or insecurity is described or defined as um, the lack of access to food in a certain period of time. So if a family doesn't have access to affordable, healthy, good food, then that family might be called food insecure. Um, in the subcontinent, there are some variations to this definition, but often the term food deficit or food security is used to talk about uh, whether people have food or not. Uh, the problem with that phrase is that it removes the agency of people themselves in determining what they want. So uh, here, imagine uh, a farmer who has had the ability to feed their families, and I know these farmers, have had the ability to feed their families uh, over generations. And now um, they will no longer have land and they might get sold out because uh, land is being speculated around them. Um, so in the West, we might call that idea gentrification, but in Kashmir, that doesn't really fly because it's gentrification at the uh, with the military in tow. So that's why we use the term settler colonialism there. But be that as it may, food sovereignty helps us refocus our attention on the people so that they get to decide what their food system looks like, whether they want to grow uh, beans or they want to grow rice, whether they want to sell locally, whether they want to grow vegetables for themselves um, or what they want to do. Um, a farmer told me, uh, a Kashmiri farmer told me that I may or may not have a car. I may, not, may or may not have a lot of money in the bank, 
But today, because of my land, I can rest assured that I will eat with dignity and I will be able to feed my family with dignity. Um, and um, that idea that the farmer has control over their land and is able to feed his family and his neighborhood in difficult times is a signal or a marker of food sovereignty. Um, that's why it's important in that condition to focus on food sovereignty rather than food security. Because if you focus on food security, suppose, um, you know, suppose a World Food Program shows up with food for everybody in Kashmir. We could technically call Kashmir food secure, but that would not be food sovereignty. People would not have the right to their livelihood, to their dignity, to their preferred foods, to their ways of living, their memories, their, the way they make meaning around food. Um, that's the reason. So why, who is doing this? I would argue that there are uh, multiple entities. Uh, one is clearly there is an interest in decimating uh, Kashmir's control over land, so Indian policies, uh, militarization. I also think that there are two other things that are uh, intertwined in Kashmir right now, which are really complicated. One of them is this modern myth of development that somehow if we had McDonald's, it would be great. And that's, an, that's a consequence of neoliberalism worldwide um, and teaching people in formal education what modernity means and what modern food systems look like. And then the last one, which also is facilitated by India, is the allowance of global corporations to take a foothold in Kashmir. Kashmir, which is very close to the apple producing region of the world, apples were actually somewhere around Central Asia. That's where they came from. Uh, but if you go to Kashmir now, in some markets, you will find apples from Chile. That is the reach of the global industry that um, has been allowed to penetrate and uh, decimate our local growers. Moira, did you want to speak also yeah, on that? Just very uh, briefly, very briefly. Um, I mean, for me, the word security itself in the context of an occupation is, uh, I mean, should just raise red flags right there because you don't want to securitize something because then it means what are you securitizing? Who are you securitizing it for? Uh, is sort of the first question that we should ask, especially for a context that we are all invested in. Uh, so, for example, I mean, from my earlier work in Ladakh, even the PDS, the public distribution system through which rice is, uh, you know, distributed among people uh, for, for a lot of people, right, for, for, for the communities that I work with, they often associate a PDS, a public distribution system with people's shifting moral character. Right. So uh, the idea was that, you know, we used to eat uh, barley, we used to eat all kinds of grains that Asmin also mentioned. And now we, because of the speedy, uh, the public distribution system that's been imposed, uh, it's giving us food all the time. It's giving us a ton of rice, but it's also fundamentally shifting the kind of people we are. So we become Pital, you know, Pital was the word a lot of uh, old uh, people, old, old, old uh, folks from the community used, which meant not resilient, not uh, malleable, not adaptable, and not at all social, right? So it, uh, it, was, it was sort of interesting to see how uh, food security did not necessarily translate into questions of ownership, both over their uh, agriculture, but also their social lives. So I think that's uh, that's why I feel the security framework is deeply flawed. Yes, definitely. And um, there are in commu indigenous communities communities within India also who are advocating for you know the the so-called Giffen grains or um, um, as economists like to call uh, you know the traditional um, indigenous um, um, crops such as bajra. Um, Mona, I have a question for you um, from one of our um, attendees. How do researchers, scholars, and communities fight back against the notion that ecosystems do not have intrinsic value, that they provide millions of dollars of ecosystem services? How can we bring uh, this into public conscience and um, maintain community, manage ecosystems, um, if not move over neoliberal development ideas? 
I mean, that's a million dollar question or more. <laughs> I, I feel we're all in it thinking about this, um, especially right now uh, as we're battling this uh, pandemic. But I, I do feel, I, I think uh, at this point, if uh, we, we do have an opportunity right now to really amp up uh, our conversations, our discourse around um, the importance of ecological consciousness. Um, especially, I feel, you know, for, with, with me, my own work in Kashmir, um, which has been on militarization and um, the environment for a long time, even for Kashmiris, it, it took a while, right? I, I feel it took like August uh, of last year to fully understand you know how an occupation how a military occupation is uh, is is the greatest threat to uh, people to Kashmir's ecology right mm. uh, so I, I feel I mean it's it's unfortunate right that um, for example right now we have we had to deal with this pandemic to at least recognize that you know if we do not, uh, force some kind of an immediate urgent change, then uh, we are done with. And I still am not sure if uh, that thinking is fully set in. It's clearly not, as we can as we can tell. But I feel it's opened up these pockets of conversation that were hitherto not possible. Uh, so I, I just don't know how you can force it, other than through dialogues, other than through raising awareness, other than uh, you know through. Um, for example, creating spaces, right, where we talk about uh, ecological systems in one place, deeply impacting ecological systems elsewhere. We think of ourselves living in an interconnected world. I mean, that's, I think, that's why I feel even for people who are not invested in the political fate of Kashmir uh, and, and people's aspirations for self-determination should at least, you know, pause for thought about what a continued military occupation of Kashmir is going to look like, not just for Kashmir, but for the rest of the world. I mean, we're talking about the Himalayan capture. We're talking about a massive water resource, a massive glacial resource. It's a third pole. And if we lose that, we lose a lot of the world, right? So mm -hmm. I, I just think that's something we need to keep coming back to. We need to keep belaboring. Um, yeah, definitely. And related to that, you know, the question of international solidarity, Dominic Griffin has a question. Um, and she talks about how she does um, anti-hunger work with ELCA World Hunger. I'm not sure what the full form for that is, but Dominic, I hope you can tell us that via the chat box. And she's asking, um, what are um, actionable ways that faith-based partners in the global community um, do to stand in solidarity with and provide meaningful support for Kashmiris? And I think there was another question similar to this um, around like unwillingness of certain countries and the role of UN, but I think we'll try to focus on the more positive things about what can other, what can international organizations want to stand in solidarity with Kashmir do in this relation? Um, so I'll start and then Mona, perhaps you can respond. Thank you for that question, Dominique. I, um, I think I want to preface my comment by saying, regardless of what area you work in, regardless of what position or stage of career you're in, regardless of what you think your reach or authority or ability to change is, regardless of that. I think um, Kashmiris are facing an existential threat and um, Mona talked about being in dialogue and sharing stories. And I would say at a minimum, whatever association or organization uh, people are affiliated with to uh, propose a teach-in or a study or a focus, geographic focus on Kashmir um, and educating your communities and your partners and your colleagues uh, about Kashmir. Um, uh, regrettably, many parts of the world still don't know about Kashmir. So doing that, and then faith-based organizations, I think are especially crucial because they have the ability to span borders, as Mona pointed out. Uh, faith traditions are, exist across the world and they have the ability to counter some of the religious hateful positioning around conflict that emerges. And vis-a-vis -vis food, um, I happen to know some of the great work that comes out of this organization with Dominique 
I think um, any projects or efforts that could support smallholder farmers in Kashmir and stand in solidarity with lifting up the local food systems would be incredible. I think supporting students in Kashmir and scholars in Kashmir, writers in Kashmir, uh, artists and thinkers in Kashmir would be um, many different ways to shore up the social, economic, environmental, human capital of Kashmir, which is at risk right now. Uh, yeah, and, and to add to that, I think uh, sort of sums it all up. Um, to add to that, you know, uh, we also rethink indigeneity in relation to Kashmir, as uh, Samina pointed out. I think it's very, very important to bear in mind that indigeneity is not just about uh, being in a place. Uh, uh, it's also about the, uh, the epistemologies, the knowledge frameworks that you bring to interact with the land that you are uh, living on. And I think that's something we need to raise more awareness around that uh, it's, it's an assault. Uh, what we've seen uh, uh, in Kashmir is also an erasure of indigenous land systems, land knowledge uh, systems that uh, we can hopefully mobilize people around some of these very critical issues um, and I know there have been ongoing conversations between indigenous groups in the U.S., uh, some indigenous groups in the U.S., and some Kashmiri activists about how we can think about land practices uh, as indigenous and what that actually means when it comes to farming and growing food in particular. Uh, and, and so what I'm trying to say is it's also a call to rethink indigeneity in relation to material practices. Mm -hmm food farming and agriculture. Yes definitely and I, I think Samina's point also earlier about linking this um, discussion to um, the interventions made by Via Campesina are really important in this relation and um, we, as we see the rise of indigenous movements again and in Americas um, uh, also, um, you know, creating those links between those movements and in Kashmir, in Kashmir and the other Himalayan regions would also be really important because these things are interconnected. Essentially, they are questions of political sovereignty um, rather than as, you know, just simply access to food um, and livelihoods. It's the way of living and um, and the way of thinking that is really being curtailed in these spaces, including in Kashmir. Um, there was a question around indigenous movements around the world um, that I can't see anymore, but are there any particular um, examples that, that either of you could share with us today about indigenous, indigenous movements, um, social movements in relation to land sovereignty and food sovereignty um, today that speak to the, the case of Kashmir and its people? Mm. Kamina has a smile because it's a lot of work that you've done on this, on this topic, haven't you? Well, I, I don't know if I've done work. I, uh, it was a, more a smile and a sigh combined. I'm not sure what to call it. Um, I have not, in fact. I think um, I have worked on um, challenges experienced by uh, Black communities in the United States and communities of color and refugees. And so perhaps uh, if I may draw from that, um, as an illustration for people who are not from Kashmir, so they can draw the links between Kashmir mm -hmm. and the United States, but also in Native American communities in the U.S. So um, in the United States, uh, in present-day United States, one of the incorrect diagnoses of what happens in Black neighborhoods is, um, say, the food environment is bad and people make poor choices about what they eat and all of this stuff. Um, and my work um, that I have learned from people, black leaders in Buffalo where I do my work um, is a reminder about the power of reclaiming ownership over the food system. I'm not sure if some of those leaders are on the call, they might be. So I'll give an example from specifically from Buffalo. Um, so COVID hit Buffalo pretty hard. And um, while we were waiting for the government to do something and put in some you know, action and help communities that are really reeling against uh, COVID because of um, comorbidities, because of poor food environments, uh, one of our elders in Buffalo uh, launched this program along with a coalition of almost, well, I don't remember the number, but 
she insisted on calling it, the idea was to help people seed gardens so that they would be more, they would be able to grow food for themselves. And she insisted that we call it Freedom Gardens. And I don't know if Ms. Gail Wells is on the call or not, but within a span of a very short time, uh, she um, helped facilitated almost 50 plus families to grow their own food. So uh, the idea was not to deliver food to them, but to think about how do you rest control from a system that has over many, many decades, multiple decades, uh, really taken power away from the Black community. For people who are not familiar with Black history, uh, Black farmers have lost land ownership in the United States much greater rates than white farmers, as an example. In the same period when that has happened, uh, food systems have changed, people, Black people's access to food has changed, um, wealth has been extracted from them. But the irony is that the U.S. food system was actually built on the enslaved labor of Black people. So what I take away from that is if you don't check the power, if you don't control the system, you can continue to have a system where you extract wealth value from people and then say that you are helping them by providing them with whatever food, etc. The conversation really needs to be about freedom and sovereignty, uh, which is what I would take away from my experience here. Um, we could also learn from indigenous movements from many different parts of the world, but as a scholar, since I haven't studied them, I'm careful about not commenting on them. Thank you. And, and that um, speaks so um, closely to the experience of the pastoral communities in Kashmir, whom we haven't like talked about today at all. I mean, some in some respect we have, but not um, specifically. And I just wanted to highlight um, that um, you know the changes that they are experiencing are even uh, more um, are are closely related to the way the land laws are are structured. And the new land laws are structured um, in I, in Kashmir. Yes. Sorry, I don't want to forget this point. I should have said this early, but you're saying this is reminding me. One of the really important things about Kashmir that everybody listening should be aware: there's actually very little land. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very large region, but it's a mountainous region. And I would be remiss if I did not point out that it's a land, it's a, it's a val there are valleys and there are plateaus, but actual land for food production is very limited. So uh, by these laws, when the, we say acceleration, we're not talking about massive amounts of land. We're saying already a land strap place we're making it worse, including for the pastoral communities. Back to you, Marush. Apologies. No right. worries. No, I think, sorry, Mona, just to add to that point. So it's only 24% of the total geographical land in, in Jammu and Kashmir is cultivable, which so it's not, it's only a quarter of, or less than a quarter of it. And the pastoral communities that we are talking about are, um, you know, um, they, they move between spaces and their ability to move um, is being restricted by uh, and has been over the last three decades due to militarization, but the acceleration of like their inaccessibility to these spaces and public spaces, um, wildlife areas, um, is also something that's under threat at the moment. Um, Mona, did you just want to? Yeah, I want to, want to uh, echo what's been said um, because if you look at the situation, yes, we're not dealing with a large uh, amount of land mass, agricultural land mass here, right? Which becomes at least in the cities, there might be some, but as you move up into the mountains, uh, the land becomes even, uh, shrinks even more. To top it with the fact that uh, when you talk about, for example, rehabilitating people, right, these communities that are displaced now uh, to, in, to, to the city, right, that puts undue pressure, of course, also on the landscape in the city. Uh, at the same time, though, uh, what's, uh, what's quite amazing to me is nobody, at least in the policy circuits, talks about the elephant in the room, which is the military occupying vast amounts of land and prime real estate in Kashmir for setting up their infrastructure of all kinds. Um, to add to that, the other thing, the land laws right, that have been enforced, as I said, for the longest time now that deprive 
uh, local communities of uh, their user rights to certain landforms. And those landforms include uh, forms such as Shamlat, uh, that some of you might recognize, also Mahajarin Zameen, which we have a lot of in Kashmir. So Kashmiris actually, at least in these mountainscapes, rely on these two landforms, Shamlat, which means collective land that is not, not owned by any one particular individual, and Mahajarin Zameen is the evacuee land, right? That a lot of people who um, ended up uh, by virtue of that line of control, the arbitrary drawing of the line of control ended up in Pakistan and couldn't return. It's their land that people have been cultivating. Now what's happening because of these extractive industries that are being set up by India, uh, the, the people are only compensated for their property, for their milkyet, so to speak, that, that they see on uh, land papers, and not for Shamlat and not for uh, the Mahajarins, I mean. So oftentimes when I spoke to uh, farmers and communities, they would literally say, you know, I can look at this mountain and I feel my stomach fills up. And they're not kidding about it. It's not empty rhetoric. They rely on the forest for all kinds of produce. So once you cut them off from that very important source of food and nutrition, you are undermining uh, their access to good nutrition and you are ultimately undermining their food sovereignty as well. So I just wanted to point out how uh, mm -hmm. absolutely, I think it's very, very crucial to keep in mind. We're not dealing with, a, you know, if there's this image of Kashmir being very fertile, but at the same time, it's, uh, I mean, it's also subject to what kind of fertile land now is occupied by an external force. Yes, definitely. Um, I'm aware of the time and we have about two minutes left. Um, so, and I apologize for the few questions that we haven't been able to take, but there are some very interesting questions there. But just to conclude, I would like to again um, say, first of all, thank all the participants who are with us today and for the very meaningful conversation we've had today. One thing we haven't gotten to talk about is the depletion of water resources due to the occupation. And um, I, uh, I know this is an important topic and very of much urgency. So this is something that Kashmir Solidarity Movement is, has been thinking about talking about in a completely different webinar because it requires that kind of attention. Um, but I'm glad we've started talking about, um, you know, how um, the occupation impacts daily lives in, in, in beyond the physicality of the, the oppression, beyond um, you know, the violence um, that is created by the oppression. So um, I would like to, with that, I would like to thank uh, both Mona Bhan and Samina Raja to join us and share the very interesting insights from your own work, but also um, my co-host today, um, Stand with Kashmir, for organizing um, this webinar. Um, any last thoughts from Sunina yourself, um, Mona? Uh, happy to go after Mona. No, I'm, you can go ahead uh, while I gather my thoughts. Um, these are difficult times in Kashmir um, and really keeping our focus on people in Kashmir and there are difficult times in other parts of the world as well. Um, at the same time, in very difficult times, there will be poets. In very difficult times, there will be people who will lead us out. And um, I want to all end by sharing a quote that is very familiar to Kashmiris. And hopefully it brings Mona and my work um, for you and connects the dots for you in a way that is uniquely Kashmiri. So I'm going to say it in Kashmiri first, and then I have a terrible translation. Who knows it better than Kashmiris that our futures lie together, um, our food lies together with our woods. The translation for the English speakers is um, food will survive or thrive till uh, the forests survive or thrive. Over to you, Mona. <laughs> I think that's great. Let's really end on that very, very profound historic note. Thank you. Thank you all again for joining us and your questions. Thank you so much for bringing us together here.